First Samuel chapter number three, starting in verse one, it says, and, uh, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that, um, that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, here am I for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down, and the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hearest. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Tonight's message, I'll, I'll explain this in a minute. At the moment, it'll sound interesting. Um, the title to tonight's message, though, is this, When God Does a Thing. When God Does a Thing. Let's go ahead and pray. Um, for tonight's message, I'm going to do things uh, slightly different. We're still on, on the series on, um, on go. We saw the word go in the passage that we read, uh, verse, uh, verse 9. It's Eli talking to Samuel, tells him to go lie back down. However, my focus tonight um, isn't going to be as focused on that. Um, the, the passage that we're in is... Um, is pretty familiar. Samuel's mother has begged God for a child and, and promised God that if he gave her a child, she would give that son back to God. God answers her prayer and she is true to her word, with, which is, is worth pointing out. I think we often skip right over that when, when reading this passage, that she, we, we see her crying in the temple and Eli thinking she's uh, drunk there at the altar and um, her promise to God. We, we focus on that and then we kind of jump ahead to where um, he's being raised and skip over the fact that she's actually um, true to her promise to God, which is worth noting because people make promises to God all the time. Um, most of the time, they make those promises with no intention of ever keeping them. Um, you know, maybe they, they think that there's no way it's actually going to happen, so they, they promise it thinking that they're safe, and then he actually answers their prayer. Um, you hear people who, you know, will make some sort of ridiculous promise to God. You know, they're in, they're in a bind, and God, if you, if you answer this, I'll... Um, what is the uh, one I heard recently? I will crawl on my hands and knees up the cobblestone steps to some temple somewhere. I don't know. But so, a ridiculous promise to God. As if they're really going to make God decide to answer their prayer by you know, making this ridiculous promise. But they, they make a promise to God like that because they think they're never really going to have to. They don't have any intention of actually doing it. They just want God to answer their prayer. You hear, um, again, people all the time that they're in a, in a bad spot praying to God who, um, who they've never prayed to before, um, that they'll give their lives to Him if, if He'll answer their prayer, but they don't think He will. They don't believe in Him. Um, I, I had a guy, I was telling my parents about this, I had a guy this last week who is a self-proclaimed atheist. And he and I were, were talking about something and this self-proclaimed atheist says, I'll pray for you. <laughs> and I am really pretty good most of the time about not saying what comes in my mind. But when an atheist says, I'll pray for you, it just kind of came out before I ever thought it through. But the words just came out, to who? Yeah. <laughs> who are you going to pray to? You don't, you don't believe there's a God. Are you going to pray to yourself? Man, that doesn't even make sense. But people do that sort of thing all the time. They don't believe in God, or, or so they say, but when they're in trouble, they'll say some sort of prayer to Him, expecting He's not going to answer. Other times, people um, make, make promises to God with the best of intentions, but either forget it or 
um, keeping the promise is a lot harder than they expected. Because it is super easy to pray and tell God that if he answers your prayer, you'll give him your life. It's a lot harder to actually do it. This lady actually follows through on her promise and Samuel goes to, uh, to, to live with and be trained by the prophet Eli. He's being raised to be a man of God. And that brings us to the passage that we started in tonight that God's speaking to Samuel for the first time. The, the passage where we read, I'm not going to have us go back to all, but it makes it very clear this is the first time that God has talked to Samuel. And we know the, the confusion that happens with him running to Eli because he assumes that it's him calling. After a few times, Eli figures out what's going on. He figures out, hey, this is, this is God trying to talk to you. So Samuel goes back to his bed, and when God calls again, he answers them, and they have, they have a conversation. I want to get the idea of the message from a phrase that God uses right when he starts off the conversation. It is where I got the title of the message. He starts off um, in verse, uh, verse 11. God said unto Samuel, beginning of the conversation, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel. That's where I get the title of the message, When God Does a Thing. So what he's telling Sam, he starts it off, I'm going to do something here. Um, Saturday, my wife and I and my uh, parents drove over to Yakima for, uh, for a wedding. And usually I'm the type, I like to take my kids with me everywhere. But we decided three to four hours of sitting in a car combined with sitting in a wedding and a reception and three to four hours home would be torture for kids. It was a long day for an adult. We decided for kids to be tortured. They, so they stayed at the Hoenn Streets and, and the, they told me when we got back at one point that I guess they, they watched a movie that the girls hadn't seen yet and Josh had. And all throughout the movie, Josh through the whole thing said, pay attention to this, this part's important. Pay attention to this, this part's important. Pay, letting them know, you know that this right here is important. You need to make sure you pay attention. And that's in essence what God's doing here. He's telling Samuel, know that this is about to be very important. I'm about to do a thing here. Make sure you're paying attention to this. Which is important for us to see because quite often in our lives, um, you're going to hear this phrase a lot, quite often in our lives, God does a thing. If we aren't paying attention, we'll miss it. I have examples um, where we've all had, had experiences like that, things that, that happen right in front of us and at the moment that it happens we are distracted by something and we totally miss it. Uh, often that's what we do with God. He's getting ready to do something in our lives but we're too, um, too distracted by what's happening around us and we miss it. I have three things tonight that, uh, that I want to point out that happens when God says, I'm going to do a thing. Number one tonight, he warns his servants. Um, I've already spent some time on, on this in the introduction this evening. God is, is getting ready to do something, but he first takes, um, or he first wakes Samuel to tell him. God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. What, what God is getting ready to do is going to affect Samuel greatly. The man who has been, who's been raising Samuel to this point um, is, is about to be punished by God. Samuel's life is going to be changed. But God didn't have to tell Samuel about it. God's under no obligation. He's under no obligation to tell Samuel. He, um, sure, this is, going to, this is going to affect him. It's going to, in ways, define his life from here. But God's under no obligation to come and get Samuel's permission, or even to warn him. I didn't have to do that. God didn't, God didn't come to Samuel because he needed his help. He didn't come to Samuel, you know, to tell him what he wanted to do, but, um, but couldn't on his own and, and would need Samuel to help him out. God didn't need Samuel's help. He's God. He didn't come to ask permission. He didn't, didn't come to ask for help. The reason that he came to Samuel was simply this, that he cared for Samuel. That he loved him. God understood the, the, the effect that this would have on Samuel. Um, so he wanted to give him that warning. It reminds me of, um, of my house. And uh, as, as the dad in my house, as the husband in my house, I, I make the decisions in my home. Or at least my wife lets me think I make the decisions. <laughs> um, just kidding, mostly. But in making those decisions, um, specifically with my kids, I am under no obligation to talk to my kids about my decisions. You know, I'm not, I'm not obligated to do that. I'm the parent, and they are, they are the child. I make the decisions, and as a kid, it's part of life. You simply have to live with the decisions your parents make. 
I don't need to ask their permission. I don't need their help in making the decisions. But from time to time on big decisions, I'll let them know about them before the decision actually happens. Not because I have to, not because I'm obligated to, but because I care for them and how it will affect them. I could give example after example in the Bible of God getting ready to do something, but first warning his servant. I'm just going to give a few. I, I spent some time this week looking at, and, and I could give you a hundred or more examples of, th of times where God was getting ready to do something major in the Bible and warning his, his servant. But I decided to be nicer than that, and I'm just going to give you a few of them. The first one, um, starting right at the beginning, Adam. When Adam and Eve sinned, God's getting ready to, to kick them out of the garden. They're being punished for, for their sin. He's getting ready, if you will, with our phrase, to do a thing here. But before he does, he tells them what he's going to do. And God didn't have to explain himself. He didn't have to explain to them their punishment and what was, what was going to happen because of their sin. He could have just made it happen. It could have been that, that Eve took that bite, Adam took that bite, and next thing they know, they're standing outside the garden with an angel posted at the gate. Sorry, you're not coming back in. It could have been that simple. Um, I think they would have gotten the picture that, hey, we messed up. But he didn't. He warned them. He took the time to explain to them what was going on. Another example, Noah, again, God getting ready to punish a people, but first warns his servant. The wickedness of the world, um, uh, or the wickedness, the, wick, the world had gotten so wicked, God's going to, to destroy it and would have been his right to destroy them all and just start fresh. I mean, he made it. He has the right to do that. As a kid, um, my brother and I loved playing with Legos, and we would, um, you know, we'd follow the instructions the first time and make it how they say, and then normally we would make our own thing, whatever it was. You know, I've always wanted a Lego this, but one time it was a helicopter, and so he just started taking pieces and, and making a helicopter. You know what the best thing about Legos is? If you build something and it doesn't turn out how you want it, you just smash it in a million pieces and start again. You just tear it apart and start again. God could have done that. He made it. He could have just said, you know what? It's all gone. I'm starting again. But he didn't. He warned his man. Another example. What about Abraham? God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for, for the wickedness of the city. He's going to rain uh, fire from heaven. But what does he do first? He warns his servant. Not because he had to. Not because he needed Abraham's permission. But because he loved Abraham and knew this would affect him. Again, we could give a, a million examples in between. I'm going to skip to, uh, we looked at some at kind of the beginning of the Bible, skip to the end. How about Revelation? What do you think that is? It's God saying, I'm going to do a thing. The day is going to come. I'm, I'm going to do something here. God didn't have to give that warning. He did because He cares. He did it because, because He cares. And the same is true in our lives. When God is going to do a, a big thing, he warns his servants, as long as you're awake enough to hear. As long as you're awake enough to catch it. And God's going to do a thing, number two, the wicked are dealt with. Um, or a less nice way to say it would be, the wicked are destroyed. Look back at our text, verse 12 through 14. In that day, I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told, uh, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Therefore, And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of, of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. The, the sons of, of Eli had done wickedly, and God says, it's time I judge him. It's time that, that I'm going to deal with this. I've allowed offerings to appease me to this point, but no more. Um, that's the, the thing that he's going to do here. Um, I, I thought about tonight going into exactly what his uh, son's wickedness was. I'm not going to go in, into a ton of detail on that because the passage gives us what God's judging them for. Starts it off for their iniquity. Their actions against him. He's... He's judging them for being vile, being judged for um, 
being judged for, for these things, I think we can understand. We can, we can agree that iniquity, sin, should be judged. We understand verses telling us, telling us that there is, is a price for sin. So we understand that, that iniquity should be judged. I think even most people in the world would, would agree that, that wickedness should be punished. And we're all okay with and agree that, that the um, vile should be judged. Those things that are just kind of plain offensive. I don't use the word um, vile often. I was thinking about it. This is not a word we use real often. But when I do, I can guarantee that it's something that should be dealt with. When we say something is, is vile, it's something we want dealt with. Um, give an example here. Dirty diapers are one of those things I think of as vile. Um, which is why when Lisa and I had our third kid, I made her agree that she would change every brown diaper. Didn't hold her completely to it, but pretty close. Diapers are vile, and they ought to be, or dirty diapers are vile, and they should be dealt with. Where we tend to, to struggle, so we can see, you know, okay, something vile, it should, it should be dealt with, it should be, it should be judged. But where we tend to struggle to understand is the third reason that God gives for judging, and that's simply this, that Eli didn't put a stop to it. But Eli didn't put a stop to it. Look at, at the end of verse 13. It just talked about that his sons, their, their iniquity, and they've made themselves vile. And he, talking about Eli, restrained them not. Part of what Eli and his sons are being judged for is that he didn't stop them. Not that he participated in their sin. Not that, that he encouraged it. But that he didn't stop it. The passage again says he didn't, he didn't restrain them. Eli is being, is being punished because his children were doing wrong and he didn't do anything to put a stop to it. Now here's what, what it got me thinking. As a parent, um, it's wrong not to teach your children right. As a parent, we, we understand that it, is, that it is our job, but I think we don't take it as serious as it is. We see that it's our job. We see that we ought to teach our children right from wrong. But Eli here is being judged of God because he didn't stop his children from doing wrong. Because he didn't, he didn't um, punish his kids. I'll use that. God, God is punishing him because he didn't punish them. In other words, it, it puts some importance on parents correcting their children. Eli is, is being judged by God because he had the popular attitude of today that, you know, that's just how they're choosing to express themselves and I don't want to mess up their psyche and tell them otherwise. As parents, it's our job to mess up their psyche and teach them what's right and what's not and what their psyche ought to do. They're, I'm going to stop there. I, I could go with that. God says, you've done these things, these things wrong. I, I've allowed it for now, but it's time that it gets dealt with. Because when God does a thing, the wicked are dealt with. The other examples that we, uh, that we saw earlier show exactly the same thing. Adam and Eve, when they're, when they're um, sent out of the garden, this is wickedness being dealt with. They had, had gone directly against the, the one rule that God had given them. The one thing God told them they were not to do. And they went against it, and they're being punished for it. Noah, um, the, the world is wicked so much so that, that the Bible makes it clear that, that the only one who didn't fall in the category of being wicked was Noah. The purpose of the flood was to deal with or destroy the wicked. God didn't do it on a whim. He did it to deal with the wicked. Abraham, uh, the entire reason for God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah was because of, of the wickedness of the city. The Bible makes it extremely clear that, that it was a, a wicked and vile place and God destroyed it because of that. The other example I gave earlier was Revelation where God again comes to deal with the wicked. When he decides it's time to come and do a thing, he warns his people, but then he destroys the wicked. He judges iniquity. And at first thought, that sounds um, like a really good thing. And it is a really good thing, as long as you're the righteous. As long as you aren't the one full of iniquity that he's come to judge. Um, in the case of Eli's sons, their, their sins were, were pretty obvious. The people knew their wickedness. But when you think of God judging the wicked, 
the prophet and his sons are not typically the ones that, are, that you're going to think of. When you think of, you know, God's coming to, to destroy the wicked, God's coming to, to, to punish iniquity, you're not thinking, oh, he's coming to deal with the prophet. And you would think that if there is someone who is righteous in this passage, it ought to be the man of God. Which led me to this simple, um, simple thought that people are not always what they appear. And just because um, you, come, you come to church and put on a smile and, and a nice show doesn't mean that your life behind closed doors isn't filled with iniquity. And you and God are the only ones who know that. Just throw that out there as a bonus. Deal, deal with it, or I'll, I'll put it this way, deal with it before God decides to do a thing. Yeah. When God decides to do a thing, His servants are warned. When God decides to do a thing, the wicked are dealt with. And then lastly tonight, when God decides to do a thing, He works through His people. The passage that, that we started with tonight, God speaks to um, this, this young man, Samuel, or, or as the, the passage started with, the child, Samuel. Um, and then, after speaking to him, speaks through him. God speaks to him in the night, and then the next day, immediately after, after he wakes up... Um, Oh, I just lost what verse it was. Uh, verse 15, And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God, uh, God, do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all things that he said. And Samuel told him every whit. Next day, God uses him to tell Eli what he had said. And I want us to, to see this from both sides a little bit. Because first off, I want to see the difficulty of this. Think of, of how hard this would have been for Samuel. For starters, this is your family. I know not, not by blood, but Eli is the man who is raising him. Would have been like a father to him. Coming to him and saying, coming to the man who is, is raising you and saying, God's going to judge you. That wouldn't have been easy. And that isn't even taking into account Eli's sons, who would have, in essence, been older brothers to him. You know, this, this message would not have gone over well. That God's going to destroy you and, oh, by the way, I'm going to be the one stepping into your place. That isn't going to be received very well. If you don't believe me, read about Jacob telling his brothers his dreams and them, them bowing down to him. They tried to kill him over it and eventually sold him as, as a slave. This message is not going to go over any better than that. This isn't going to go over well. It's going to be, to be hard because they're family. And, and I'm sure that, that despite their wrongdoing, he still would have loved them and didn't want to see them punished. They, they deserved it, yes. They, yes, they had, had done wrong, but wrong or not, when, um, when you love someone, you don't like seeing them go through something like this, this is going to be, to be hard. It's going to be hard because it's family. It's going to be hard because, simply put, it's a hard message. Delivering a, a message of judgment is not an easy thing. If I could preach... Um, good news all the time and only, you know, tell people happy things and always preach gumdrops and lollipops, that would be great. You know, it really would be nice. You preach a message about, about, um, about judgment or, or approach someone about wrongdoing, they get mad. They don't like it. The problem with that is the Bible's more than just gumdrops and lollipops. I don't know where I got that phrase from. I'm not really sure where that came from. But I'm sticking with it. The Bible's more than just gumdrops and lollipops. Delivering this message for Samuel would have been, would have been very, very difficult. But then the other side of this, um, the other side is, is this. The, you see the, the difficulty of this, but also, um, I, I tried and tried to come up with a good way to put this and never could. So I'm just going to put it this way. The great step that this meant. From this point, um, Samuel now um, steps in. Yes, this is a, a hard message, but then God places him in a position to be used of him. When, 
when God does, does a thing, He uses His people, and yes, there are times that, that are hard. I would love to tell you that you know, ministry is, is always easy. I absolutely love it and wouldn't change it for the world, but it isn't easy. There are, are times that it's hard, but if we allow Him to use us, He'll use us to do mighty things. Here's the conclusion this, this evening of, of the message. Um, I'm really going to bring it down very, very simple. When, when God does a thing in your life, which side of it are you going to be on? Simply that. Which side are you going to be on? The, the one God is having to deal with or the one that God is using? When God does a thing, He warns the righteous, the wicked are dealt with, and He uses His people. Let's pray.